Good evening, everyone. I'm Laura with the Thought Bubble Podcast. If you are new here, I am an MSW student graduating this May. I'm currently completing my internship at an outpatient mental health clinic in the role of as a psychotherapist. I also have my associates in human services and my BSW. Um, I know coronavirus is all anyone ever hears about, and it can be confusing to determine what's accurate and what's in the news. There's a lot going on, there's a lot of different things we're being thrown at, and things are really changing pretty rapidly. And a lot of what I've been seeing on the internet, at least, is, because I mean, I don't talk to social workers in person anymore, it's just a lot of people on different, like, Facebook groups I'm in for social workers, a lot of people saying, what can I do to help? Like, how is a social, as a social worker, what can I do in this time, as in this situation? And so I am here today to answer just that, talking about the social worker response to COVID-19, coronavirus, um, and what exactly we can do during this time. I know a lot of social workers are essential workers, and some of them are still going out into the field. I think that recently just changed, even essential workers are being told to stay home at this time. I think it changes every day, so it's very, it's difficult to keep track of the different regulations and policy that's going out. So to begin, something that I want to start off with is talking about a crisis and what a crisis is, what that looks like, Um, because something that is important to remember is that in social work practice, we are not just some helping profession, right? We aren't just people who want to help people. That's great. That's good. That's fresh, you know, fun stuff. We, but we are founded in evidence-based practice. We are skilled professionals, right? There is a science behind what we do. There's also an art behind what we do. Um, but we don't just like do these things just because we like to help people. We do these things because there's evidence-based theories and practices and research that back up the things that we do. So before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about what a crisis is, what that looks like, not just in terms of coronavirus, but different crises. Um, we'll dive into some crisis theories and then we'll, um, really talk about social workers' response, um, on all levels. So break it down into terms of what a lot of social workers do on the micro level, which I know is a lot of different social workers, meso level and macro level. I feel like in terms of this conversation, there's a big overlap with micro and meso work just because I know a lot of micro social workers do a lot of community-based work as well. So there might be some overlap there, but that's perfectly fine. Um, as always, if anything ever like piques your interest during this conversation, or you want to add something, or I don't know, maybe I get some type of information wrong, please let us know. Um, there's a comment section wherever you're listening to this on. Um, and just, yeah, join the conversation. So to begin, we're going to be talking about different theories behind what, behind what a crisis is. So first, Lawrence Brommer was the founder of the modern applied crisis theory. This is the theory that I kind of go to, I guess. And within this, he talks about four different kinds of crises. Um, So first we have the developmental crisis, situational crisis, existential, and ecosystemic. So the developmental crisis would be an abnormal response to typical developmental events. So typical developmental events, what are those? You know, growing up, being a teenager, um, going to school, friendships, peer relationships, changes in the family, getting a sibling, right? Um, and even just like personal things. I don't know, with females, it could be, you know, getting their period for the first time. With males, different things in puberty. This can lead to developmental crises. A situational crisis is an uncommon and unpredictable event that causes extreme stress. And once again, I mean, a lot of it is in the name, right? So situational crisis, it's a situation, like one event, really, that causes a lot of stress. An existential crisis is the result of interpersonal conflict related to a person's purpose or contentment. I think that's probably one of the most well-known types of crisis, types of crises, crisis, um, is an existential crisis. A lot of people kind of just like to throw that term around. Um, And once again, 
I'd like to repeat, even for non-social workers out there who happen to be listening to this, we want to be very careful and cautious of our language. So in social work, we pride ourselves on using people-first language. We don't say convict, we don't say prisoner, we say people, person who is in prison, person who is incarcerated. Um, we don't like to say, oh, that's so PTSD, oh, I'm so OCD, oh, I'm so bipolar, because those are serious mental health diagnoses. So we don't like to throw that stuff around, and that goes the same thing with an existential crisis. When someone's experiencing a crisis of interpersonal conflict, that's a, a, it's a big deal, right? <laughs> like, that's not something to joke about, it's not something to kind of just toss around. So just be very conscious of your language. Um, next we have the ecosystemic crisis, when a disaster overwhelms a person or system. I think something interesting about coronavirus is, obviously this is a worldwide event, it's a pandemic, so we go straight to the ecosystemic crisis, right? It's affecting the world, and I do believe it is an ecosystemic crisis, but it can also be more than one thing, right? So I do think people at the micro level are could be experiencing crises like this. It really just affects so many things. I think generally, though, coronavirus would... Um, be included as an ecosystemic crisis because it's such a large scale. The next theory we have is crisis theory by Kaplan. So basically he defines a crisis as an imbalance that results in confusion and disorganization. Now there's something about this crisis. So what I like about the modern applied crisis theory with Lawrence Brommer is that he kind of goes through different types of crises so a lot of different things can fit into those categories, right? So you have the kind of micro crises, you have larger scale world pandemic crises. With the crisis theory, it's very applicable to really just direct practice micro work with clients. Um, so it's very more person centered rather than applicable to macro level work. Um, so that's really just an imbalance that results in confusion and disorganization. I was, the definition that Kaplan gave was imbalance. I don't like to say imbalance, because, because what is balance, really? Um, but just to throw that out there. This is derived from a psychoanalytic theory and also ego psychology. So Kaplan also give a, gives us four phases of a crisis. So basically the first phase, we can kind of all picture what a crisis looks like. Um, a lot of this is associated with high levels of anxiety. So at first... There, an event happens, a person experiences increased anxiety, and coping mechanisms, coping skills are tried, right? They're implemented. If the coping skills do not work, a person has a crisis, right? Um, then there's also that increase in anxiety, which is phase two. In phase three, the anxiety increases even more, and the person may feel that shift so much that they ask for help. And then in phase four, the last phase, it is an active crisis. So the person's inner resources and supports are inadequate at the time um, to assist them in recovery. And that may allow for them to engage in impulsive or unproductive behavior. Um, with Kaplan's theory, crisis theory... He also talks about different types of crises. Here, he only gives two. So maturational, so that would be like a developmental crisis that Lawrence Brommer talks about, and then a situational crisis that Lawrence Brommer also states. So in this just very simplistic crisis theory, it's very micro-based, person-based, like I said before. Something I think that's important to note that is just because it's very micro doesn't mean it can't be applied to the macro. Right, we might have to make some changes, but I do think generally we can think of systems as people because there's a lot of different things that influence people, that impact people, different resources, right? And within a system, it can kind of be viewed as the same way. So that's why I mentioned crisis theory, even though it's kind of smaller scale, it kind of is just like, well, how can this apply to coronavirus, right? It's still important to note because a lot of our micro skills can be transferred to macro crises, right? So our next two theories that we're going to be talking about are more intervention-based. 
So how, how do we respond in a crisis? And again, a lot of the theories um, that I found um, in terms of social work and psychology related to crisis intervention are once again micro. Um, I'm thinking about it right now, actually, <laughs> sitting here recording this. I'm, I'm going to take a guess and say maybe public health um, and sociology has more macro level crisis intervention models. Um, if you know of any, drop them in the comments, let us know. That would be wonderful. Um, but I always think we can't forget that micro models can still be effective at the macro level, right? So in Robert's crisis intervention model, we have a few things. So you want to assess lethality, you want to establish rapport, identify major problems, deal with feelings, explore alternatives, develop an action plan, and follow up. So a lot of times we kind of see the cri this crisis intervention model kind of like on crime shows, right? When someone is maybe having a difficult time, right? They're experiencing a crisis and then we have law enforcement come in and um, use crisis intervention skills, at least on the crime shows, that is how that is portrayed. And that's done, right? So this is kind of what's happening there at the micro level in a very person, situational or developmental crisis. Could even be an existential crisis with a person, right? What's important about the crisis intervention model, even though it's very person-centered, is I think all of these areas can really be seen in terms of the coronavirus and in terms of a pandemic and a macro ecosystemic crisis. So we want to assess lethality, right? So in terms of coronavirus, what are people doing? We have doctors, researchers, everyone, scientists, all these people. We are assessing lethality all the time, tracking the disease, keeping track of mortality rates, people who are healing, recovering, spreading, right? So you're assessing the situation and you're assessing lethality. How dangerous is this virus and what are the what's the impact of this, right? Next, you want to establish rapport. I think of this because, if you can't tell, I'm in the United States. I live in New York. Um, you want to establish rapport. And something that perhaps government officials could do a better job at is establishing rapport with U.S. residents, okay? Um... I think that is the struggle that this administration has had is because there's a lack of rapport, people are responding negatively to the response that's given. I don't know if that makes any sense. That's very vague what I just said. Um, but basically, I think government officials could be doing a better job at responding to this crisis if they have better relationships with the public and with citizens in the United States and even all over the world. I'm speaking from the U.S. because I live here. Now, the next thing, identify major problems. So first we have the crisis, right? Um, coronavirus, that's a big problem. But what are the other major problems? We're talking about um, essential workers. Who's essential, who's not? Kids going to school. What happens if we shut down schools? What about after school programs? What about um, child abuse and neglect? What about domestic violence and IPV? What about poverty? What about law enforcement? What about incarceration? What about all these different factors that come into play when we respond to something like this? And we have already seen people crying out because different areas in our society have been forgotten and have been overlooked and have not been taken into account. So you want to identify the major problems. Next, we want to deal with the feelings. Um, validate those feelings, right? large scale this is this is a pandemic a lot of people are feeling anxiety overwhelm um hopelessness a lot of fear at all levels all people all walks of life um and being able once again for more public figures to deal with the feelings that the public like the larger society is expressing I think would also be beneficial um, in terms of establishing rapport, validating that experience, um, and having empathy, really. Next, we want to explore alternatives. So that's with anything. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. What are all our options? Can we combine some of these options? What is the best thing that we can do? And then once you kind of find that, develop an action plan, 
Okay, so how are we going to tackle this? How are we going to respond? What, how can we work out all the kinks? How can we get through this? And then next is the follow-up. Because I think the bottom line is something we need to remember. It's just because we formulate an action plan, once it's actually implemented, that's when we're going to see what works and what doesn't. Sometimes we think we have crafted the perfect plan, the perfect response, right? We think we haven't forgotten the community. But then we implement policy, we implement change, regulations, we respond to something, and then we realize, oh wait, <laughs> I guess we kind of missed this area. We forgot about what happens when kids aren't in school. We forgot about what happens when people aren't working. Or you know what, we forgot that um, people who are currently on unemployment are making more money than people who are essential workers exposed to coronavirus. So you want to follow up, and then I would add another step after that, not even just follow up, but revise the action plan and implement it if needed. So in terms of the crisis intervention model, even though, again, like I said, it's a micro model, we can apply that to macro level things like a pandemic, like coronavirus. So lastly, our last um, intervention model for a crisis is the critical incident stress debriefing. Again, this is a type of crisis intervention at the micro level. This type of thing focuses on the here and now. So basically in this situation, you're very focused on the present. We're not going to look back at um, the past. In this situation, I think it's beneficial to learn from the past, but again, this is a kind of micro right? Focusing on the here and now. What can we do right now? How can we help right now? And you want to debrief quickly after the incident and you may act to prevent um, resulting trauma. So basically, this is kind of one of those models where you want to act very quickly, very effectively, and focus on what's happening here and now. And this kind of reminded me of what's going on with coronavirus just because everything is changing so rapidly, right? So we need items from the crisis intervention model, but we also need to understand that this is stress happening very quickly, very rapidly, changes every day, every second. Um, and so we need to be on top of it. We need to focus on what's going on right now, here and now, because yesterday the statistics aren't what they are today, right? More people have died today. Um, so how are we doing this? What are we fixing? What can we do? How can we respond today to create hopefully a healthier, better tomorrow, right? So those are four of the theories, um, the modern applied crisis theory, crisis theory, crisis intervention model, and the crit critical incident stress debriefing model. So with all of that, all those theories, because social workers are evidence-based practitioners, best practice, evidence-based practitioners, how do social workers respond in a crisis that's so large scale like coronavirus? I think generally, some things that we want to keep in mind, um, big social worker things, themes, if you will, um, is creativity. There's a lot of changes right now. Um, and this is kind of a territory that I guess in this realm, no one has really experienced, right? In this generation of social workers. So we need a lot of creativity. Um, I'm doing teletherapy with children and adults. I have of all ages on my caseload. Um, how can I do play therapy with a five-year-old with ADHD? How do I make that effective? How do I help him pay attention, right? How can I make that an effective session? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, clients are still getting billed for all this. Their insurance is still doing all that, right? And unless that's something that's changed with coronavirus. Um, so we need to be creative, creative solutions. I know I saw something on a Facebook group again. There was a social worker who works in foster care who had to do a home visit. It was a couple weeks ago. I don't think that's happening anymore. But they had to stay six feet apart. So how is she supposed to engage with children, do activities with them if they can't be next to each other, right? It can be kind of awkward, especially when you get like infants in foster care. I guess it's not really awkward when they're babies, um, but like staying six feet away and just sitting there watching a baby. Maybe that can be uncomfortable. So creativity, advocacy. This is a time for advocacy because like I said earlier, populations are being overlooked. Um, communities are being ignored. People are just honestly not being cared about and it can be very complicated 
right? This is um, an interesting, rapidly changing situation. So advocating for the people that we work with, the clients, maybe that would be insurance coverage. Maybe that would be advocating to have more people released from prison and jails. Maybe that would be advocating for, honestly, funds, finances, such a big thing right now, right? Advocating for working at home. Some people, even though there was like federal regulations, there was one place I saw that was still having the workers come in for a meeting, which was crazy. Um, the second, the third one is resourcefulness. Kind of like creativity. This is a time when a lot of different places are actually doing wonderful things, right? So maybe different restaurants are offering free lunches for children and people. Um, Maybe clothing stores are open, um, more donation centers. Um, Really, I think the top things that come to mind are like food and donation centers. Um, And this is, again, one of those things that's very, everything is changing very rapidly. So you really got to be on top of it, you know, very you know, reach out to people in your community, be like, okay, what is this agency offering? What is this agency offering? What are the restaurants in my community offering? Who's staying open? What about programs for these kids? What online resources? Again, we don't just want to think about in-person resources. We want to think online. There's a lot of online support groups, online therapy, online activities, the internet, full of stuff. Use it. Fourth thing is applying social work skill. We are a specialized profession. We need to be licensed in order to work. We need to have our degree in social work, right? We don't, we aren't just any, any people walking around giving advice. No, 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 no. We have skills in social work and we need to use them. So again, that could honestly just be going back to the NSAW code of ethics, values of the profession, principles of social work all those goods. And then lastly, one of the most, not most important, but something that I like to keep in mind here is Maslow's hierarchy of need, right? So that kind of goes physiological need, safety, love and belonging, esteem, and self-actualization. It is a pyramid of need, basically, that people face. Right now, this is a crisis. And even though we are all experiencing the impact of the coronavirus, the impact is different for everybody. Some people, like myself, my routine isn't really different. I'm still doing my internship, my coursework, everything from home. I'm still doing all those things. I'm also a student. I do have like a work study position, but I'm still getting paid for that. Um, And I have money in my bank account to pay rent, right? From my student loans. So I'm fine. Um... There are a lot of people who are not in a situation that I am in. I am, a, I am in a place of privilege right now. Um, there are people who are really facing a lot of difficulty. And so in those situations and with all of our clients, no matter what they're in, making sure you're taking into account what they need right? What's the most important need? And also make sure, right, Maslow's hierarchy need, I think is very beneficial. I like to keep it in mind, especially in therapy sessions too, right? Because I always think to myself, how can a person work on their depression when they don't even know if they're going to make rent next month, right? You want to keep those things in mind all the time. But I also want to make sure you guys understand, take your client's perspective into account as well. Because if they still want to work on their depression, even though they're having all this stuff come up about their rent, more power to them, right? Ultimately, self-determination is what social workers would like from their clients. So Maslow's higher care need is very beneficial, but do not forget to actually contact your clients and get their perspective, get, get truly what they want, you know, what they view their needs are during this time, because they could see things that you don't see. So now, those are some general things, general things that kind of were coming up for me in terms of what to keep in mind during all of this. Now, in terms of, like, practical skill, so in micro-social work, something that I'm doing is teletherapy at my internship. Whole bunch of resources out there. Um, Teletherapy looks different for all my clients. Some of them I'm doing Zoom video chat. Some of them it's just a phone call. It's going all right, (laughs) right? We have to be very creative. Um, 
I've done a lot of processing with all my clients about coronavirus and how that impacts their mental health. And it's, that's been an interesting time. So really just allowing space for that conversation to take place. I think in terms of video chat, it has been different, right? I think phone calls have been more difficult for me. Um, just because when we're on video chat, like Zoom, you can like have a whiteboard come up, you can share your screen so you can show a video or you can like, it's just like seeing each other, right? It's that whole dynamic of therapy. So it's different. It's a little bit easier for me to do that. Um, I've still been doing group sessions on Zoom. Um, so just providing those things. So continue with teletherapy. I know in New York state, um, we also had a lot, like over 6,000 social workers and mental health professionals volunteer to do a crisis hotline specifically for people whose mental health was impacted by coronavirus. Um, so check your state resources as well. In terms of micro work, gathering your resources. So like we said earlier, financially, um, what are some resources? Are, are there any grants? What's the funding going on? Um, small business loans, anything like that. Soup kitchens, donation centers, grants, financial assistance, and also navigating government assistance, navigating applying for unemployment. What does that look like? Um, part of my work study, um, which is for my financial aid for college, is actually working in a nonprofit where I am a workforce development coordinator. I help people get jobs, write resumes, write their cover letters, practice interviewing skills, and then eventually apply for jobs and hopefully come through and get some. Um, and what I've seen with that is I still have to do that job during this time. So what are some resources available where I can still help people navigate applying for jobs during this time of many people being laid off and working from home? There are a surprising amount of people that are still hiring. So don't let this situation also make you feel like you're doomed um, because there are still a surprising amount of resources out there, even for applying for jobs. Um, creative solutions, like I said, one of those biggest things is creativity. How can we do this? <laughs> you know, um, I had to do that when I had a parent to one of my clients who would do family therapy with, who just didn't have the technology and the resources to do teletherapy. So how do we navigate that situation? Um, she wasn't able to do a Zoom video chat. Um, so what does a phone call look like? right? Um, and then my phone, for some reason, stopped working for conference calls. So, okay, what are some other things I can do to make sure this family session happens? Because it was also important. That was the only time they really got to see each other. Something that I think is the most vital part in macro social work is monitoring and checking in with the families and children on your caseload. We're all working remotely now. I think even essential workers stay up to date on your caseload. Um, coronavirus is not the only crisis that is happening right now. Uh, there have been increases in suicide rates and people overdosing on substances. This is a stressful time, first of all, but now this is a time of social isolation, um, being unable to contact others, to be in touch with others, like in person a lot, um, kind of being at home, getting bored of the routine, getting bored of what we were doing. A lot of the struggle with my clients is getting bored of the coping skills that they used to rely on all the time. They're sick of them. They don't care about deep breathing anymore. They need something else because they've done it every day, all day long for weeks now and they're sick of it. <laughs> so stay up to date with your caseload. There are a lot more dangers now. People are forced to stay home. What does that look like for people in domestically violent relationships? What does that look like for children um, who are being maltreated or abused, right? So safety, safety, safety. If you need to prioritize one thing during this time, it is safety, right? Food, shelter, safety. At this point, school is, a, school is on the back burner. If kids aren't learning, that's fine. Are they safe? Right? Are they in a safe environment? Is mom in a violent relationship? How do we help her? Are shelters open right now? Great question. <laughs> Find out. Making sure you're still using those social work skills. Like I said earlier, New York State is, um, has over 6,000 mental health professionals that volunteered for a mental health crisis hotline. If that's something you're into, volunteer during this time. Volunteer. Pr 
pro bono services. It could just be, you know, any anything, anything. So many people are benefiting just because of mutual aid. Volunteer as a social worker, but you can also just volunteer as another human being, right? You don't even have to be in your social work role. This is just a time for helping others, forming community, and finding a new normal, right? Being there for your neighbor. Um, going back to safety, create safety plans with your clients. Um, and this again is where creativity is going to come in, uh, because things are different now. Psychoeducation on coronavirus. There's a lot of PDFs out there and books, videos on YouTube for talking to kids about coronavirus. There's a lot of kids with misinformation, a lot, a lot of adults with the misinformation. Um, and so it's so important to make sure that you talk to kids, you talk to adults, you check in with them about what they're feeling, how they're thinking, fears, anxieties, anything like that, and educate on coronavirus. Don't just focus on mortality rates because that's not going to help anybody. Honestly, focus on recovery rates. Focus on the positive changes that are being made. But also make sure that you validate their feelings. You validate what they're experiencing. You're validating that impact of what happened to them. Coping skills, coping skills, coping skills. This is a big one because coping skills are incredibly important during this time. And now the things that people used to rely on are changing because they're bored, right? And so you're going to have to be creative with your clients. Um, Use this time to explore different things. I personally started painting Um, I'm not good at it. It's pretty bad, but it's fun. You know, it's something I never tried before. Um, I started painting and I realized I liked sketching better. So that was cool. It was a learning experience for me. Um, another important part to micro social work is online support groups and classes. So this just is also isn't just about your clients, right? You also want to stay educated, you know, taking webinars, all those things. A lot, a lot of agencies are offering free webinars now, free, um, continuing education credits, a lot of free stuff, which is awesome. What a great time. No, that's maybe sounds bad, but like what a good opportunity, Um, to use during this time is those free courses, free education, because I know a lot, like some NSAW webinars are like $200 or more, like (sighs) pretty hefty load for a social worker. Um, And also remember online support groups, right? It doesn't just have to be through your agency um, online. The internet is vast. Please use it. Now that you're stuck at home with your computer working remotely, Use the internet. It has a lot of good resources. Social media. This is another thing. Um, good segue from talking about using the internet. Social media. Um, I know on my Instagram, it's mostly like education based, like for social workers, but also using this time as like for psychoeducation, like public psychoeducation, right? Um, correcting misinformation but also just as like a mental health support for people, right? Um, Start an Instagram page, you know, or get active on Twitter. Um, Because honestly, a lot of politicians, a lot of people, a lot of everyone is using Twitter for advocacy purposes, which is really cool. So becoming a part of that conversation, um, you know, calling people out (laughs) on Twitter actually seems to be pretty effective. So go for it. You're, you might be home, right? You, uh, may not know what to do. If you're in a privileged situation, you might get bored. So, uh, maybe call out some politicians that you're not a fan of or advocate for resources, anything, have fun with it. Um, and also another thing in terms of micro work is again, making masks for civilians and medical staff. So that'd be kind of like volunteering. So finding different creative ways that you can volunteer. I also want to say, um, in this part, because this just brought something up for me in my memory. Um, I was talking in my parent support group about talking to kids about coronavirus. There is a free PDF book on the internet called coronavirus, a book for kids. It's phenomenal. Go get it. I highly recommend. Um, But I was talking to the parents in my parent support group about if they talk to their kids about coronavirus, right? Have they gauged what their kids' fears are, what they're feeling? Because huge adjustments, huge adjustments. Kids are so impacted by this. Whether they say it or not, they are experiencing the weight of what's going on. Checking with them, 
talking to them about coronavirus because if you don't they could be living with so much misinformation and so much anxiety that you do not know about so even as the social worker being able to educate your um, parents that you work with about how to talk to kids about coronavirus but also you as the social worker checking with the kids about coronavirus something that we talked about in the support group was um, kind of making it fun for kids they get to stay home that's fun um, you know, you want to make sure there's a schedule, there's a routine. Um, there are some moms who, you know, they have their kids wearing the masks. That can be scary. Make it fun for your kids. Turn it into a game. Decorate the masks. Make the masks look like superheroes, right? Um, you want to make it fun. Make it a game. Don't make it seem like a scary thing they have to do to protect them from this killer virus because that's not going to help anything. <laughs> um, so just food for thought, creativity, right? In terms of mesosocial work, like I said earlier, donations, fundraisers, the internet is there. Use it. Um, this is a great time. People are home. I know I was, sometimes when I'm procrastinating all the work I do have to do, I keep adding things to my shopping cart online. I just bought a planner that cost $100, at least. <laughs> um... So, you know, what a good time to dig into people's pockets that are able to afford it. I don't want that to come across poorly. Um, but, you know, creating donation pages, creating fundraisers, or advocating for funding, right? Community outreach that can go back to resourcefulness, being aware of what resources are available in your community. And not only that, but assessing your community and seeing where resources are lacking, where the gaps in services are. If you see a gap, fill it. See what you can do to fill it. At least try. At least make it known that a gap is filled, right? Or that gap is not filled. You want to ensure resources and supports are in place. School lunch programs, child care services. Are teachers checking in with their own students? Are students still being educated? First of all, do students have access to technology to even continue distance learning school? Do schools have access to off-site computers and technology? Is there safety in the home? Provide hotline numbers, like I said, safety plan with your family. Um, what I said in the beginning was there's a lot of overlap with micro and meso work because I think a lot of um, micro-based social workers do a lot of community work, group work. So there's going to be a lot of overlap here. You want to do community education classes. So not just like online support groups. But this could be webinars, right? Do a Facebook Live. Have fun with it. You are a social worker. You're a professional in the field. Just do it on your personal Facebook. Educate your family and friends on Facebook about community resources, community supports. Do what you need to do, right? Um, mail out information to families and homes. Phenomenal idea. I had to do that with a client because her phone was out of service and all this had happened and I hadn't been able to talk to her about teletherapy. So I had to mail her a letter. Literally two days later, she gave me a call on her new phone. Amazing. <laughs> do not underestimate snail mail. Um, and also post information in public. People still have to get groceries. People still have to go places, um, gas stations, grocery stores. Make sure that information is available in the places that people are frequenting and still going to. Essential places like grocery stores um, and things like that, where you know people have to go to survive. Post flyers. This is a time where flyers, wow, very useful. So go around, post them like crazy, get the information to the people. And again, online support groups and classes and social media is so important right now. A lot of people are home. A lot of people are on social media. I mean, just generally, even without coronavirus. So use it. It's a great tool. In terms of macro work, I feel like this list is shorter. I'm not a macro social worker. Perhaps in the future. Who knows? Um, but I always feel like a huge part of macro social work is advocacy. And that's with anything. Advocacy happens at all levels, but in terms of large legislative policy change, advocacy is key here. Contact, write, tag on Twitter, local, state, federal government officials. That could be things 
like we said earlier, for anything, protections for frontline workers, income supplements, expansion of health care, expansion of minimum wage, advocating for medical supplies, advocating for funding, for resources, advocating to have people released from jail and prison, advocating for law enforcement to stop their nonsense. <laughs> anything. Go for it, right? Identify what policy is needed and what policy can be used right now. This is a time everything is changing every single day. What do we need right now? Kind of goes back to the crisis theory that we were talking about earlier. So you want to explore alternatives, identify the major problems, develop an action plan, and follow up, right? There's a lot of policies being implemented every single day, a lot of policies that are being changed. So with that, with macro social work, look at a policy, tear it to shreds, see where it needs to improve, see where there's gaps, call those gaps out, and then try again and advocate for that change to be met. Again, social media. All politicians are on Twitter now, apparently. Not sure why. But, you know, easy access. It's great. So social workers, everyone at all levels, not just macro work, use social media. I'm going to say it for the 10th time. Social media. All social workers... Show compassion and implement your social work values. We are a skilled, professional, highly educated, evidence-based profession. We are amazing. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a social worker. Um, But use your skill. Like, I didn't just get my bachelor's degree, and I'm not just about to graduate in May with my master's for no reason. I have skills. After five years in school, I hope I would. So use them. You have experience. You have internships. You have field work. You have practice. There's scholarly articles on the internet that you can be reading right now. Use those skills. We have them for a reason. We do great work for a reason. There's research behind what we do for a reason. So use those skills. And lastly, something that I think is probably one of the most important pieces out of all of this is allow yourself time for healing and time for self-care. There's some social workers like myself who are in privileged situations. Um, Maybe they married rich and they don't have financial concerns. (laughs) Um, I say that lovingly and as a joke. We're all in different boats, right? weathering the same storm and it's important to take care of yourself we already have difficult jobs we already have stressful jobs we already have traumatizing excruciating jobs that i love i love social work it's my passion but it's hard right so self-care was already important but now you put a pandemic on top of it and it's like wow wow our clients are now in crisis resources are completely cut, changes are happening every day, social workers are so important right now, so needed, and our role looks differently because now a lot of us are working from home, as all essential workers, I think, are now working from home, correct me if I'm wrong, so our role is different. How can we effectively work remotely? How can we effectively check in with every single person on our caseload, make sure everyone is safe and well-fed and drinking water? How can we do that as social workers? And I think the number one thing is it can get stressful. This is a crazy time. This is a stressful time. This is an anxious, overwhelming time. But you cannot serve the people on your caseload. You cannot advocate for policy change. You cannot do any of this stuff without taking time for yourself to understand how you're feeling, understand how you were impacted by coronavirus, What's going on with you? You cannot, you cannot effectively do your work without understanding where you're at, where you're coming from, and taking care of yourself. So please, please, whatever that looks like for you, healthy coping skills, please do that. This is a stressful time for everybody. Our jobs are already stressful. Please implement (sighs) self-care. So thank you everyone for coming to... The Thought Bubble podcast. It's been lovely talking. Um, I'd like to apologize. I'm very sporadic in the content that I post in all platforms, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, my podcast, a lot of things, my blog posts. I kind of struggle. Um, I'm not a consistent person and I will admit that. I'm working on that. 
and I'm trying to do my my best. Um, now with coronavirus, I have had kind of that impact felt where consistency has been put on the back burner, honestly. Um, but I do want to like acknowledge that um, I'm trying to be more consistent. I do believe that when I graduate in May next month, wow, next month, I will be doing better at this. I promise. It's been a little stressful. Um, so please show me some grace. Um, but I hope you enjoyed today's conversation about coronavirus and how social workers can respond. There's been a lot of questions like, wow, what can we do? Um, and as social workers, we can do a lot, right? Um, so some huge takeaways. We talked about different crisis theories, crisis intervention models, that are usually micro-based but can be applied to a pandemic in this situation. And also, what can social workers do at the micro, meso, meso and macro levels? And there's a lot of different stuff we talked about. If you have any feedback or any additional information, anything at all, please let us know in the comments wherever you're listening to this. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. I have an Etsy where I sell therapy and social work related things. Um, let's see, let's see. Oh, I don't know. It's out there. Um, but thank you all so much for coming to listen. Hopefully I will become more consistent at this. And I look forward to hearing your feedback and continuing in this wild journey with you all. Thank you. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Wear a mask. Stay home. And self-care. Bye.